would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. Welcome to Tuesday, September 6th, 2016. I hope everyone had a great holiday on Monday. Had a chance on Labor to go out and celebrate a little bit. And I also hope we're staying on target with whatever your goals might be for this week. I think the main topic for today is going to be the five top housing markets um, and uh, how that has affected real estate in those areas. Since those areas obviously present elevated levels of opportunity, right? If you've got uh, areas where there's jobs are increasing, then we want to know about that so we can provide them with what they need in terms of housing. Whether you're an investor who's got the buy and flip mentality or the hold and rent mentality, those are great markets to get started in. So we'll cover some of that today. We've got a couple of little tidbits of news that I wanted to hit before we get into that, though. And of course, before we get into the show in general, I wanted to let everyone know how to best get in contact with me. The uh, best option for you is going to be the website at www.therebelbroker.com. Head on over there, and you'll find a menu item titled Contact the Rebel Broker. Just click that. You'll be given an opportunity to send me any ideas, suggestions, observations, or questions that you might have. And I would be oh so happy to uh, respond and give you whatever feedback I might have on those subjects. Of course, there's also still the audience demographic survey up. Uh, There's a big red button at the top of the website uh, titled Take the Survey to Help the Show. Uh, you would absolutely be helping the show uh, by taking that survey. It'll let me get a good idea of what some of the demographics are for my listeners. So please, if you have a moment, uh, take a minute out of your day to answer those questions. There's only five or seven, so it's not a it's not a big deal. It's not going to take up a lot of your time, and you'd really be helping the show. Okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to hit was kind of the confidence thing. We've talked about confidence before. Confidence is a huge one in terms of uh, indicating what things are likely to come down the pike. You know, as, as often as we talk about numbers and what we'll talk about today in terms of um, different areas that are showing different levels of promise, one of the big things out there is confidence. And it, obviously, there's the seller side and the buyer side in general. But it's a great way to try to get at least a little bit of a future indicator as to what we can expect, if if not in terms of the total volume of folks that are going to be involved in the buying and selling process, at least the mindset, right? The tempo. Is is this going to be a situation where folks are really gung-ho to go and get involved in real estate, purchase a property, sell a property? Or are folks out there really sort of not horribly enthusiastic about the process? Or, Or... even worse, are, are there folks out there who want to get involved in some capacity but aren't because they just aren't confident that either the real estate market or the economy or the job situation is going to be looking good enough for them to want to get involved? And we've, we've looked at this from a couple of different aspects in the past uh, because it gets a little bit complicated. Um, one thing that we've noticed, and this is continuing given the most recent numbers, um, According to this article from Risk Media, homeowners are feeling increasingly confident that now is a good time to sell a home. Renters, however, are feeling uncertain they'll be able to afford to buy, and that and that's according to Risk Media, which is quoting a uh, Zillow Housing Confidence in- Index. Now, as you may know, we talk about the index whenever it gets revealed um, to sort of get an insight into these things. Um, but but the thing that's holding things back. Because remember, the problem we have right now is an inventory one. There still seems to be plenty of demand. Even in my market, there's still plenty of demand. Homeowners are confident about the current state of the housing market, and the majority believe now is a good time to sell a home. But when you talk to a lot of those folks, another problem that you run into is that they're not confident about finding another home for themselves. 
Now I have run into the, and it, so it depends on the mindset of the person doing the selling, right? Now you, I think one good thing when you read data like this, because this is, this is data that indicates where, where you see disparities between regions can have a little bit more of an influence on the decisions you're going to see getting made. So let me give you my area, obviously, which I'm most familiar with, Silicon Valley, is a good example. Now, when I talk to sellers who are super confident and jazzed about going, it's typically related to the the cost disparity that's regionally based, right? Let me give you a few examples. Now, with only, God, I'm trying to think as far back as I can now, over the last year, uh, I've sold a number of homes as the listing agent, and in in just about every case, with one exception, my sellers were going to another state. However, in every one of my uh, circumstances, my sellers were going to a, in terms of our market decision, in terms of our disparity of price market considerations, they were going to a more affordable marketplace. So that's tend to be the dynamic I have seen. I'm not seeing as much, you know, we're going to go ahead and sell in this part of Santa Clara County to buy in that part of Santa Clara County um, because people are, I, I think that there's the vibe that people feel like the market here is super expensive. So yeah, there's a heck of a lot of confidence on the part of sellers in my area about selling their home in terms of how much money they think they can get and how quickly they can get it. Uh, but if they are sellers who are forced to buy in this area, that confidence tends to evaporate. They don't like the idea of having to do it. The only way they can make that work for them is if they're going smaller and I've had a few folks who are who haven't become buyers who have looked, but when they see how much it costs to buy a home that's really just a little bit less size than theirs, they're not horribly jazzed about the prospects of taking on that level of debt relating to a home that's smaller than the one that they're trying to sell. Now, granted, it, it still works out mathematically. I mean, it's not one of those situations where they have a bigger home and they're moving into a smaller home and they're going to lose money on the deal. It's it's still a transaction where they're making money. But I think they're surprised by how much money a smaller home is still going to end up costing them. And then, of course, in Silicon Valley, if you're making that shift into a marketplace where it is still more expensive, like, for instance, Morgan Hill. Uh, in the places that I've listed in Morgan Hill, these folks were leaving the country, or not the country, excuse me, the state. So uh, my most recent was uh, New Jersey was where those sellers were going. Uh, the sellers that just recently closed were going to um, someplace up north, but not, but a very inexpensive market, someplace in Humboldt County. Um, and then clients from last year went to Sacramento. Uh, which at that time and, and still today is a much less expensive marketplace to get into than what we're seeing uh, if you're trying to stay local. So keep that in mind. When you hear numbers like this, you have to try to figure out, all right, in my marketplace, what part of that equation do I most likely represent? If folks are looking to stay generally in an area, and, and in a lot of cases they are, California I think is a little bit of an outlier simply because we, we see amazing numbers here in terms of the number of folks who are looking for strategies to exit the Bay Area. Remember the last time we talked about it, the number was up around 34%. I haven't seen anything in my experience so far this year that indicates that that number is actually going down. I think there's still a lot of folks who want to go, um, and it's in conversations I have with with folks who are looking to sell, that absolutely seems to be a part of their strategy. Uh, so for me, the dynamic is clear. I live in a more expensive area, so the only, uh, well, well, in all of Santa Clara County, I actually probably live in a lower medium-priced Location Morgan Hill is, is less expensive than, say, a lot of parts of San Jose. And as soon as you start heading more north towards San Francisco, as soon as you get into Palo Alto, San Mateo, those areas, the prices just go nuts. We start getting into those million-dollar-plus average uh, areas. So in the dynamics of my local area, there's not a lot of folks who are going to want to stay in the general area and move away from here unless they're moving south. Uh, the further south you go, real estate gets less expensive. Morgan Hill is more expensive than San Martin to some degree to, based on just the qualities of the homes that you get. But the big jump doesn't really hit until you get down to Gilroy. And the average prices in Gilroy are less than they are in Morgan Hill, which is the next big town south from Morgan Hill. And then as soon as you start going down to like Watsonville and Salinas and continue to head south, those prices just drop and drop and drop. 
So, so for the best way for these numbers to work for you, figure out where you fit in, in terms of your strategies, and perhaps let these strategies work for you based on that. And how do I mean by, how do I mean work for you? Well, by trying to figure out what the dynamic is, where people are trying to go to based on prices or uh, what the mentality of folks buying might be coming in based on these confidence numbers, you can kind of get a feeling for areas that hit a nice soft, a nice soft spot in terms of having a little bit more payoff for each dollar you spend in real estate. A good example would be you don't want to buy in San Francisco right now. I really don't think the return on investment makes much sense, at least if you're looking to invest, unless you can get some fantastic deal on something and flip it uh, or renovate it and then rent it. It's just not going to happen, and those are so rare and so difficult to so difficult to find. And when then when you find them, there's so much competition for them. Uh, it's really difficult to acquire them at the price point that you want. the The better deal is, as we've talked about, in some of these mushroom communities that have that are just outside of San Francisco, but are within a reasonable commute that were just a a certain amount of degrees cheaper than San Francisco. And again, even that fits in with these confidence numbers, right? Confidence numbers for folks who are buyers in San Francisco really cratered last year, and that precipitated this migration of folks into other areas. So again, by understanding where you fit in the marketplace or how these kinds of numbers might fit in your marketplace, you can anticipate where, where demand is going to go. So So for instance, let's use these numbers that we talked about probably a year ago as they related to San Francisco. Folks who were then interested in buying in areas just outside of San Francisco are probably doing very well right now. Their investments are probably performing uh, at a higher level than they had originally planned. So it had a good payoff for them. All right. Now, renters, as we mentioned before, are less confident than home buyers, with only 37% confident that they will be able to afford a home in the future. And we've done a ton of different shows on the makeup of folks in this position, whether they're renters. And we've also got it more broad in terms of just folks kind of in that I should own a home price bracket who don't own a home and why they don't and what their primary motivations are and what their major concerns are. The most confident homeowners are concentrated in the western and southwestern cities like Seattle and Dallas, which also have the least confident renters. Overall, U.S. housing confidence inched up in July to 67.3, up 0.4 from January of 2016. Um, and again, it's a it's a homeowners versus renters type of a thing. Uh, and we can obviously see that homeowners feel like the value is good. But as soon as they put on their buyer hat, remember that that homeowner selling scenario is double edged. Every home seller is a home buyer. For the most part, there's, there is that rare person who's turning themselves into a renter for one reason or another. But by and large, someone who's going to sell their home is looking to buy one someone else, somewhere else. So it's the downside of the buyer's equation that I think is what always needs to be kept in your mind when you're looking at these confidence numbers. Let's see. According to this article, while overall confidence in the housing market is up nationwide, several indicators point to fading confidence in a number of large markets particularly the most expensive and or fastest growing markets, according to July 2016's Zillow Housing Confidence Index. Uh, And I'm going to obviously put a link to this index uh, for you to review, if you like. Exactly what we were just talking about. I think some of these higher stress stress markets, these big markets, really have more of an influence of this dynamic in terms of helping you as someone trying to get an uh, get the market sussed out these numbers have a lot more play for you and of course we've t- I've come at this sort of from the are you going to buy and flip or buy and rent standpoint but even if you're just going to buy uh, let's say this isn't something you're worried about you have no you'd have no intention of becoming a real estate investor but as much as possible, you want to treat your purchase of a home as an investment, so you want to buy smart. Remember, that's what we keep saying. You don't make your money when you sell your property. You make your money when you buy it. It's the super smart buy that makes you your money when it comes time to sell. So by keeping things like this in mind and this disparity between sometimes very relatively close areas and how that confidence dynamic affects it, you can make a purchase that's going to appreciate more quickly and potentially be a property that when it does come time for you to sell, you're going to make a lot more money because of a shift in the market that's gone from perhaps a a more uh, influential market that's next to where you are versus actually buying in what was that really hot market uh, when you were actually out shopping. Uh, A lot of peripheral markets around San Francisco have blossomed in terms of property values. 
based on this idea that folks just decided they weren't going to play that game of chasing higher and higher prices. Um, now, as I mentioned, I'll go ahead and include a link to this article uh, that'll give you some nice insights into this particular issue. Um, and also, there's a great little chart there to help you visualize it. Homeowners that say now is a good time to sell versus homeowners now is a good time to buy versus renters who say now is a good time to buy. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. There's a lot more in that article. We're not going to cover all of it here in today's show. But if you would like to check it out, go to www.therebelbroker.com and you can uh, visit it through the link that will be there in the show notes. So make sure to take advantage of that. Right now, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go ahead and talk about those top five housing markets for jobs jobs and sales growth uh, so that you might take advantage of an opportunity uh, in one of these communities that's growing. So stay right there. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, the Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525. California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Hello everyone and welcome back. We just wrapped up taking a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the consumer confidence stuff going on as it relates to buyers and sellers. It's always interesting information to sort of sit back and, and get an idea of just people's attitudes, because a lot of that can feed into how much activity you see in a different marketplace. Uh, and I know it's had a big effect on my local marketplace, so hopefully you can use that information to your advantage in the same way I do in my business. Now we're going to go ahead and jump in and talk about the five top housing markets uh, for jobs and sales growth. And of course, the reason why we do this is it helps us anticipate a variety of different things, whether you are an investor who's looking to, an- to get into a marketplace when it's heading into a growth mode. Uh, and of course, One thing that follows uh, along with a growing real estate marketplace or a marketplace that is at least going to be stable or robust or show a lot of demand in terms of the product you're offering are going to be areas where we've got jobs growth, right? And, And just general growth in terms of what's going on in that small micro economy of that either section of a city or in that city overall. So, and of course, it's also one of the things that we want to take advantage of in terms of available information whenever we're making our decisions on where we're going to buy for, and things you might want to ask yourself if you are someone who's going to use your property, whether it's someone who's going to rent it or someone who's going to buy that flipping property, excuse me, what's going to be their perspective? Try to put yourself in the in the in the driver's seat, so to speak, of your customer. Where where are they likely going to work? Uh, what kinds of incomes are generated in the areas within a reasonable community? Those types of things. It helps you get an idea for the at least the the demographic you might experience. And the best places to do that, backing those ideas up with numbers, right? Because we want to try to to anticipate with as much data as possible, what to expect. Uh, And one of those things is clearly going to be a rising job market. Um, And one of the things that can help us do that is taking advantage of other people's research. Now, Realtor.com has a research team that identified five major markets that have seen the most growth in jobs and home sales over the past two years. Uh, What's interesting about this is, again, like a lot of other research we've talked about over the last year, this isn't the markets that we've heard a lot about before. Some of them have been on lists we've talked about before. There is some crossover, uh, but it's not these big flashy, it's not Miami, it's not, it's not San Francisco, it, it's not Las Vegas, um, and that's what's important. The, the idea here that we want to jump into these marketplaces when they're about to become the markets that people know about. Now, number five on this list is Raleigh, North Carolina, and if I'm not mistaken, Raleigh has absolutely come up on our list before in terms of interesting areas to consider when you're looking into investing, and I know Raleigh has also been kind of an interesting area for a longer time than that. Back in the early 90s, uh, I had friends who were investing in Raleigh, and they've been very happy with the properties that they hold in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
And these folks don't even live in Raleigh, North Carolina. They actually live in Denver, Colorado. So they've enjoyed a great deal of appreciation. Um, If I'm not mistaken, I think they actually own own two or three properties. And I think two of them may be owned outright at this point. So they're, they're... at, they are insulated from anything bad. Um, you know, and I know a lot of folks in investing talk about leverage and it's good to work with other people's money and that's all great, but there, there comes a time when other people get their money back. Um, and if, if the, and it depends on what shifts happen in relation to that money. If that money becomes more valuable as time goes on than what you're paying in interest, well, then great. But if it doesn't, if something bad happens uh, and you suddenly can't make ends meet, it's better to not be as leveraged. So when, when people, and this isn't part of this article, but when I talk to investors right now and we talk about leverage positions uh, in terms of how much money do you want to owe on this property? Do you think it's smarter to put more money down or more or keep more money in your pocket? And for the aggressive investor, it's almost always keep more money in your pocket for that next transaction, right? Get get as much money as you can out of that loan so that you can continue the momentum of, of your purchases. That's all great. <laughs> But it's also similar to the kind of thinking, particularly when taken too far, that I saw happen to investors who got completely slammed by the downturn. Um, So there's that. If you can't survive a long downturn financially, you're going to end up with foreclosures. So in my personal opinion, I'm suggesting a less leveraged position. And I, and I, that, that makes me the least sexy guy in the room, right? The, the headline for every other guy who suggests investing or comes to you and gives you that sexy headline, that sexy pitch, how you can buy your first house with someone else's money. I, I get that that's a thing. Um, I'm not, uh, sadly, I'm not that guy for you tonight. I don't, I don't believe that that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Uh, I'm actually of a, of a mind that if you're at least 20% into the property, you're probably better off in the long run. Um, and of course, this is all going to come down to the homework that you do, trying to estimate where the market's going to go, how stable you feel like the market is. One of the reasons we talked about veterans locations, or not so much veterans, but uh, active duty military personnel housing in various areas where there are military installations is because that provides a higher level of stability, right? Some of the, some of the things that I think you need to decide are the level of love risk you're willing to take. And of course, that level of risk is a huge sliding scale in the world of real estate. So, and some of that risk is how much debt do you want to assume based on this property? How can can you sustain it? Are you are you uh, in positive cash flow with a lot of elbow room, or are you just squeaking by? And is that a squeak that looks like it'll stay there and get bigger, or or are you not so convinced it's going to get bigger? Is there a possibility that you should insulate yourself against a downturn relating to what you can garner from renting uh, a property? And of course, this is a little bit more of a concern for folks who are going to do the holding strategy. If you're going to flip it, that's a whole other set of calculations, and it's much more short term, uh, but it's also something that you need to keep in mind. And I think in markets like this, these markets where where we're seeing growth, those are also markets that would tend to draw individuals who are interested in doing a buy and flip strategy, depending on how quickly that, that inventory is turning over in those areas. All right, so as I said, number five on the list today is Raleigh, North Carolina. The number of jobs created is 47,000. The unemployment rate sticks at 4.6%. And of course, as always, we like to go just a little bit deeper. Now, the median sales price in Raleigh, North Carolina is $245,000. Median rent per month is $1,350. Median sales price is up, but also median rent is up. Um, It's jumped really about 50 bucks. uh, And it did that back in June and has sort of stayed at that point. But the median sales price looks like it's on its way to just continue to grow. It, it reached its lowest point in February of this year at 203000 and now it's uh, sitting up at around two forty-five. So that's a pretty decent amount of growth, and this chart indicates that uh, doesn't indica- seem to indicate that anything is slowing. Now, of course, as we've talked about with other areas, your best bet is to try to get an understanding of what's fueling that. Uh, if some bizarre, not solid thing is fueling it, 
then maybe you want to think twice. Uh, you'll want, Raleigh, North Carolina, for me, uh, the things I tend to hear are it has a relatively diverse uh, economy in terms of different things that are going on there. A lot of, a lot of high-tech things, I understand, are happening uh, in, in between Raleigh and some of the areas north. I know if you go up north to Wake Forest and then over to Chapel Hill, there's sort of this high-tech thing happening. Uh, you'd want to know more about that, but it's something that you should be aware of. Um, if we go ahead and take a look at... Homes for sale right now in Raleigh. Let's let's sort of get some real on the ground information in terms of what's happening. Uh, I see a pretty good variety in the north ends, like around Millbrook and and, and north of the 440 freeway. So not downtown Raleigh. I'm seeing $125,000 for a two bedroom, two bath. I'm seeing $380,000 for a three bedroom, two full bath. And then when we get down to downtown Raleigh. Let me just zoom in there so we can sort of get a feel for what's going on. A lot less for sale. I'm seeing a lot more volume. If you look at sort of the, if you look at it as a barrier, sort of the 440 freeway and the 40 freeway circling Raleigh, not as much is, is up for sale in that area. It tends to be more sparse. But what I am seeing downtown, I'm seeing a two bedroom, one full bath for 185. I'm seeing a two bed, two full bath for 229. A two bed, two full bath for 135. Four bed, two bath for 399. Uh, in downtown, three bed, three bath for 199. Three bed, two bath for 375. So I'm seeing a lot of uh, variety in terms of prices. You would want to also overlay that with an idea of. Uh, Rental rates, if you're looking for a buy and hold strategy, which is always where my first instinct goes. I'm not real sure why I'm biased that way. Um, and, but I realize for a lot of you, that's not a a uh, proposition that you're too happy with. So for for what you would want to look like, look at, you'd want to look at how quickly things are turning over, what's what's selling quickly. Now, what's interesting is in that same area, that, still, that downtown area of Raleigh, I'm seeing pretty robust rental rates. Um, if we look at a one-bedroom, one-full bath, 650 square foot um, in university, which I'm I'm not sure what, what that's in proximity to, but I'd, I'd like to think it's near a university. Is, is that what it's saying? Uh, is 1,350 bucks. Uh, two bed, one full bath, 1,400. Uh, two bed, one full bath, 1,250. On the, let's see, this looks like the east side of the downtown area. If you consider McDowell Street sort of going through downtown. That would be 1300 for a two-bedroom, one-full bath. So I'm seeing relatively good numbers. I feel good about these numbers. I mean, if you're getting for a, um, a uh, two-bedroom, one-bath, $1,200, $1,300 a month, that's pretty darn good. Now, for a, And, of course, as we've talked about before, the, the beauty of a bathroom, there's another unit here for, for rent, a uh, single-family home, $1,695 for a two-bedroom, Two full bath, twelve hundred square foot, uh, which is uh, four hundred dollars more than the other one we were looking at. That was a two bedroom, uh, one full bath. So absolutely consider that. These are all great indicators that not only can you go there, get yourself a reasonably priced home, but then also once the time comes, you'll be able to uh, uh, get the rent that you desire. Uh, that could give you some really good positive cash flow. All right. Coming in at number four on our list is Boise, Idaho. Home sales growth is up 13%. The number of jobs that have been created is 17,000. Unemployment rate at 3.6%, according to this. So below 4%, which is outstanding. And it looks like it is the second best unemployment rate on our list. The best uh, on our list is going to come in at number two at 3.4%. But we'll try to keep that number two city as a surprise. Now, if we look at some more data for Boise, Idaho, according to Trulia, the average listing price, this may be another one of those regions where they don't publish sales prices. So remember, these are the prices folks have asked for their homes. They, this is not what they have sold for. The average list price is $297,452, and ab- median rent is $1,275. If we go in, let's take a look at the market trends first, though, before we do that. Um, let me see. And it looks like what we're seeing is... Uh, a pretty good range of prices depending on county. Let's actually look at what's currently for sale in Boise and see what kind of a range we're seeing for for different homes. Um, All right. And if we go into what looks like downtown Boise, 
Again, a pretty good variety. It looks like there's a disparity between the north end of town and the south end of town. Uh, if we head up into the north end of town, as you head up into what looks like a little bit more of the outskirts of town, I'm seeing a home for 410, which is a 400, uh, excuse me, four bedroom, two full bath, single family home. As we move in a little bit closer to town, I'm seeing some uh, prices that are a little bit more in range with what we were calibrated to by the overall market overall market report. I see here a three bed, two full bath for 229900 uh on the north side of the Boise River, $395,000 for a two-bedroom, three-full bath, $400,000 for a four-bedroom, four-full bath. And if we go to the south side of the river, where prices look like they're getting a little bit softer, $125,000 for a two-bedroom, one-full bath, $249,000 for a four-bedroom, three-full bath, $130,000 for a one-bedroom, one-full bath, uh, $125,000 for a four-bed, one-full bath, which... And so absolute lack of utility there. Uh, always keep these things in mind. A four-bedroom house with one full bath is nuts. Um, that needs at least two full baths. Uh, it would be interesting to see the configuration of that home depending on its age. Typically in the past when I've seen a four-bed, one full bath home, that means a home with no master suite. So you end up with just a master bedroom that's larger, but everyone gets access to a hall bathroom unless this is some uh, renovation style home that was some smaller configuration that's been sort of Frankenstein into this in this sort of deal. Uh, so always keep in mind that sort of stuff. Obviously, this is something you'd notice right away when you go in and do a uh, inspection of the property. Uh, but you want to remember that you're trying to find a place here that's going to have the broadest level of appeal for folks who are going to be renting. You don't want to be the last house that gets rented. You want to be the first house that gets rented. So keep all of that in mind as you're moving through. Now, the highest price property I'm seeing sort of down here in the semi-downtown area is showing up as $875,000, four bedroom, four full bath, uh, still on the south side of the Boise River, but down towards southeast Boise, where it's just ages above uh, all the other prices I'm seeing in that area. I see a three-bedroom, two-full bath for 168. I see a two-bedroom, one-full bath for 129. I see a three-bed, one-full bath for 195. So that's that's definitely a high mark in terms of price. Uh, 273 for a five-bedroom, three-full bath. So lots of different variety here in Boise. Let's see what things are renting for. And again, when I do this search, I'm not looking at apartments. I'm just looking at homes for rent because that's obviously what you would be renting. And again, if we look at the same general area of Boise, kind of zoom into that downtown area we were just talking about, I'm seeing some pretty good rental rates. Now, as we noted before, um, there was sort of higher prices in the northern side of the Boise River. What's interesting to note is, on average, the price on that side is a little bit higher, but there doesn't seem to be a huge disparity. Let's go for, through a few here. 1800 a month for a three-bed, two-full bath on the north side of the river in downtown Boise. I'm seeing 2695 for a two-bedroom, two-full bath, uh, 1995 for a bedroom, four-bedroom, two-full bath, 2175 for a three-bed, two-full bath in downtown Boise on the north side of the river. Um, so these are good rental rates. And it, 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 given what we saw in terms of what was for sale, these are rates that I think you could easily uh, achieve positive cash flow with given the various properties that we saw listed just a minute ago. Uh, let's see. Now, there is one property here, uh, two bedrooms, two full bath, single family home, $2,995 in downtown Boise. Um, so I'm seeing some really attractive opportunities here. Also, you'll the, you'd be, the southeast Boise area shows a lot of very robust rental rates. Uh, and the south side of the river, sort of just directly across from downtown, shows slightly less robust numbers. We're seeing 1700 for a four-bedroom, two-full bath. So that's a lot of house for that amount of rent. Three-bedroom, two-full bath, uh, 1500 located in what's called Depot Bench of Boise. So it looks like the most desirable areas are going to be the ones that are more probably more centrally located on the north side of the river uh, and pros possibly in the southeast Boise area in terms of just at first blush, looking at the at the ratios between cost versus rental rates. Those look like some of your best places to head. 
All right. Next on our list is number three, Charlotte, North Carolina, that showed home sales growth of 11%. Number of jobs created more than 75,000. Unemployment rate of 5.2. We've actually talked about Charlotte before. Charlotte's been on a number of our lists in terms of different elements that make it attractive for investments. This is just one more. I'm not going to go over the... um, The details for this one, again, we're getting a little bit long on this particular story, but we'll go ahead and do it for the next two because I think they're interesting and they're also ones that have been on our list before. If we go in at number two, Nashville, Tennessee, home sales growth of 10%, unemployment rate of 3.4%. So this is our lowest uh, unemployment rate on this list, uh, which for my money makes it super attractive, something that you're definitely going to want to look at and see how you feel about the numbers that are there. If we get a closer look at the details for Nashville, Tennessee on Trulia, let's see, we can see that according to the Trulia, the median sales price, again, median is the price point where half of the homes are above that price and half are below. It's not the average. It's $266,000. Median rent per month is $1,750. If we take a look at the acquisition costs here in general for Nashville, let's go ahead and pull that up here real quick um, and kind of zoom right into downtown Nashville here. Um, Again, a lot of interesting variety. Some trends here that I'm seeing are Music Row tends to be a little bit more affordable, at least just given the really quick look I'm seeing here. Uh, I'm seeing a home for 220, well, maybe not. Uh, This is a $225,000 property, one bedroom, one full bath condo. $319,000 for a a two bedroom, two full bath condo uh, in downtown Nashville. Uh, As we head a little bit out, you know, I'm trying to see where the most affordable area is here. East Nashville, uh, $300,000. Here's a four bedroom, two full bath for $474,500. We'll see if we can't calibrate ourselves to that when we look at um, rental rates here. Now, whenever you're looking at a city, this is one other thing I kind of think you should draw your eye to when you're doing a comparison. One thing I often like to do is when I'm doing an initial long distance evaluation of an area, get the homes for sale on on one window on your screen and then next to it get a window for for properties for rent so you can get calibrated to what things are renting for in different areas but in addition to that you want to look for holes where are areas where there is nothing for sale and nothing for rent that screams out an area unless it's absolutely not residential at all that screams out an area that is potentially a ridiculous opportunity. Now, the one thing that jumps out to me in terms of nothing's for sale there and nothing is for rent there is sort of this wedge of uh, Nashville that, according to this map, is identified as the Arts District. It, I guess it would be sort of centralized around Church Street in Nashville. Now, I've never, I think I've been to Nashville once uh, within the last 20 years and probably sometime in the mid 90s. But just by looking at this kind of plotted data, you can get an idea. There's another area called Music Row that's interesting. Why is it so interesting? There's one home for rent there. It's a three-bedroom, three-full bath, 2,700-square-foot uh, home. Uh, they're describing it as in Edge Hill, and it's $3,900 uh, to rent this property. What's interesting is I'm seeing a number of properties for sale in Music Row ranging in price up from six hundred and ninety-nine k. Uh, for a four bedroom, three full bath, down to three ninety five for a two bed, two full bath. Um, but even then, don't be scared off necessarily by some of these higher prices. If you're seeing rents that are in this range, and if you can get homes rented in those range in those price ranges, that's pretty amazing. Uh, Nashville, just from the what I'm seeing, has got a lot of of uh, different sub markets that indicate ridiculously high levels of rent. Uh, Here's a six-bedroom, three-full-bath home that, that is up for rent for $4,750, way down at the end of, uh, I don't know, the 70S near 31st Avenue. But that's a ridiculously high amount of rent. It looks like the highest amount of rent I'm seeing on this zoom-up of downtown. But sort of lay them out like this to get an idea, and if we sort if we take a look at... Uh, on the north side of the Cumberland River in Nashville, there's sort of a wedge of properties kind of hugging up against the water where, again, I'm seeing more homes for rent, but only one home really for sale. I'm seeing a $385,000 home, three bedroom, three full bath. Now, if I wanted to rent that, 
a three bedroom two full bath a three bedroom two full bath in the same area is going to cost two thousand seven hundred and ninety five dollars to rent a two bedroom one full bath sixteen hundred a two bedroom one full bath sixteen fifty and a th- three bedroom two full bath uh, eighteen hundred for an area that's very close down near the river um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at these and also note the differences between condos and single family homes uh, in terms of comparing what you potentially could buy versus what you could potentially rent it for. Now it gets a little bit more interesting when we look at the area north of, well, what area would they call this? They would, there's no real description of what this is, but again, it's an area where you're getting a lot more data. So you can purchase a home here for what looks like around 400, 425, 300, and then rents in that same neighborhood look to be around 2000, 2000, 1850. Uh, So you kind of calibrate yourself to some general numbers here. And when you're doing this math, just sort of a side note, always give price yourself about uh, some amount, pick a, pick a percent that you think makes sense. I like to, uh, depending on what price ranges we're talking about, I like to price myself at least 10% below properties that are showing up for rent in the neighborhoods like on Trulia or Zillow or other rental sites, simply because I don't want to be the, the property that people can see up on Trulia. I want to be the one that's already rented. So I want to beat out the competition. I want to be there first. So when you're running your numbers, run them with that sort of a mindset so that you know you're putting yourself in a position that you're going to be the home that's rented, not the one that's sitting on the market for four months waiting for someone to come along who's going to rent it. All right, so finally on our list, number one, Portland, Oregon. Um, This is one that we've talked about before. This has been on a lot of different lists in terms of uh, not just growth over the last couple of years, but expected continuing growth. And frankly, I just hear a lot of good things about Portland from folks who've who've been there and, and who've, who've invested there. Uh, it's treated people fairly well. Now, according to Trulia, three hundred ninety thousand is the median sales price. Median rent per month is two thousand one hundred. If we take a quick look at the trends, um, they're all showing growth mode. Uh, the lowest point we've seen in the last year was December at 325,000 and we're at 390,000 now in September and that's been relatively flat since about June or July. Um, Median rents have uh, stayed relatively flat since June at 2,095 back in June, uh, 2,100 in July, uh, 2,135 in August and then the number they're tracking here in September and remember we're only five days into September, so this is going to be a lot less of a sample size, is also 2,100. So my guess is going to be that it'll be on par with what it was for August. Um, I, I wouldn't, I'm not even really sure why they'd want to put September rental numbers uh, in, given that we're so early into the month. But again, let's go ahead and take a look at what it takes to acquire a property here in the real world of Portland. Uh, homes for sale. And again, I'm focusing a little bit more on the downtown area. Now, one other thing to do, Uh, is if you're interested in a specific community, kind of let it sit in that zoomed out view and look for where things are happening. Uh, where, Where is the highest concentration of stuff? Now, a lot of times these aren't going to show you uh, all of the transactions. They'll only show you a certain amount of homes uh, per screen. So you might need to zoom in a little bit and scroll around to see what the, the volume you want to see. Uh, but you want to go for that area that tends to have a little bit more opportunities, but you're going to want to do the same thing in terms of rentals. And in here in Portland, where I'm seeing uh, a highest volume of rentals tends to be the home, uh, the neighborhoods on the west side of the Williamette River as they go through Portland. So it's probably a good idea to maybe focus your attention there a little bit because at the same time that I'm seeing a lot of folks properties for rent, not seeing a huge number of properties for sale, a good number, uh, but it just shows there's a lot of demand uh, in those areas and a lot of folks are are apparently interested in living in that part of town. And of course, getting in there and getting ground truth is going to be interesting for you uh, to figure out why that is. What are these different areas? What makes them interesting for, for the folks that are living there? Now, if we take a look here at... Let's see. Let's find a neighborhood with some rents that are pretty clear. Uh, yeah, these are, some of these prices are insane. One point two nine million, uh, one point five million. Um, let's see here. But the rental rates I'm seeing in those areas, I'm actually not even seeing anything for rent in those areas. But if we go in the Northwest District, for instance, uh, relatively low in terms of homes for sale. Uh, in the Pearl District, I'm seeing $435,000 for a one-bedroom, one-full bath. 650. These are both condos for a one-bedroom, two-full bath, 
condo. Uh, and in terms of rents in that same area, I am seeing 1,000. Uh, wow. So let's see here. There's multiples for rent at a place called The Wyatt. $1,825 for a studio, up to $5,495 a month for a it looks like a two bedroom with uh, with two bath. So it, uh, these are some ridiculous numbers. These are the kind of numbers I see, at least in terms of just amount to put in here in terms of investment amounts. This might not be for the newcomer investor, at least these downtown areas of Portland. Um, but this is clearly an area that's showing a lot of growth. Even outside Portland, on the east side of Portland, I'm seeing rental rates for studio apartments of $1,000 a month, um, $1,400 to $4,298 per month for studios up to two bedrooms. Uh, so obviously a lot of hot stuff going on in downtown Portland. And if we zoom out, is there sort of a is there an opportunity here for you to get uh, – see, this is an area where I'd start to apply what we talked about earlier in terms of the mushroom effect. Where can you go to get away from the super expensive stuff here but still be close enough to um, to provide housing for folks that still need to get into downtown or, or want to be in that area? Um, at first, I was thinking maybe something like Park Rose, where rents are a little bit less. Um, seeing, and again, remember, this is all just me doing stuff. Never been to this area, just looking remotely to get a handle on it. But I'm seeing interesting things relating to uh, an area called Maywood Park. And so, what drew, drew my eye to Maywood Park? I've got the double screen thing going on here. I've got uh, homes for sale a map of homes for sale on one side of my screen. I've got homes for rent on the other side of my screen. I kind of followed major arteries, which included the 205 freeway, the 84 freeway, uh, and, and just sort of looked for areas that were presenting more reasonable opportunities. So let's go ahead and and, and, and use that same thought process anywhere else where you're looking. You know, I'm seeing pro homes ranging in price from 188000 uh, for what looks like a shack, frankly, a two-bedroom, one full bath uh, that's right over on the uh, west side of this Maywood Park area. And then I'm seeing other properties, $290,000 for a three-bedroom, one full bath, five twenty-five for a four-bed, two full bath, three nineteen dollars for a four-bed, two full bath, six hundred dollars for a five-bed, four full bath, uh, 340 for an eight bed, three full bath. So I'm not really sure what's going on here in terms of some of these sizes. These places are pretty gigantic, but it may lend itself to something that might be uh, pieced out in terms of what you're renting to. I'm not sure how dynamic a market where there would be for that. But then the rental rates in that same area are eight, 1,850 per month uh, for a, let's see, for a two bed, one full bath. I'm seeing two bed, one full bath, single family home for fourteen hundred. Um, and you know, at, at first blush, looking at this sub market within this area of Portland, I'm not seeing a huge opportunity for positive cash flow without putting tons and tons of money down. So you, but you could continue this process. You'd look for areas that look like they present an opportunity in terms of representing the price range that you're interested in buying uh, versus a rental rate that you're look that you're feeling more comfortable with. Um, Glen Fair is another one that sort of jumps out at me in terms of prices, where I'm seeing prices of one hundred and forty five thousand. For a two bedroom, one bath condo, one hundred and ten thousand for a two bedroom, one full bath, uh, two oh nine for a three bed, one full bath, and in that same area, I'm seeing rental rates of one thousand six hundred, nine hundred ninety nine, one thousand one hundred and ninety, those types of things. So you can do that real quickly to get a little bit better of an idea to decide whether or not you see some opportunities here. Um, and I get that there's been a lot of growth here, but just given what I'm seeing in terms of some of these areas, my, my first thought would be that there's a pretty good probability that this may have gotten to the point now where it's really difficult to get a positive cash flow option going, particularly when compared to some of the other communities we've already talked about today. Um, but again, jump through this particular uh, set of steps. When you're doing your analysis, I think it's a great way to get that very first blush of what's going on. And then, of course, you'll want to get more data so you can make a more informed decision. All right, folks. Wow, I've really burned up a lot of your time today. I apologize for going so long. Uh, I hope uh, I hope I haven't totally outstretched your commute. Thanks again for listening. I realize how valuable your time is, and I do appreciate you spending it here with me. Thanks for listening, everybody. I will talk to you all next time. <laughs>